Hello and welcome to The Bazooka. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevo. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we'll look at 10 OSCE stations in one clinical course. And today is a season finale of season one, pediatrics. So instead of us looking at 10 OSCE stations, we shall look at 20 OSCE stations. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel, drop a like, drop a comment, share the link to someone who you think is writing exams and may benefit from these videos. Warning in advance, there may be some graphical images and videos in this presentation and they are only used for teaching purposes. So grab your piece of paper, grab your pen and let's go. So station one, look at the image and answer the questions. Part one, what is a diagnosis? Part two, list at least two, list at least four causes. Part three, what is the management modality? Part four, mention any two long-term complications. So I'll give you two seconds to think through this. Here comes the answer. So obviously this is a child that has hydrocephalus. List any four causes. Remember that the causes may be congenital or they may be acquired. And congenital, they may be obstructive, meaning non-communicative or non-obstructive or communicating hydrocephalus. So it could be congenital aqueduct stenosis. They could be dandy walker malformations, Arnold Chiari type 2 malformations, intrauterine infections such as toxoplasmosis, cytomegalovirus, which is CMV, rubella, and meningitis. What is the management modalities? You could have medical management where you could perform what is known as endoscopic guided third ventriculotomy, which reduces the amount of CSF, or you could give this child acetazolamide. That's if this child has moderate to mild hydrocephalus. Or surgical approaches may be used for patients with severe hydrocephalus where you could add a ventricular peritoneal or ventricular lumbar or ventricular atrial or ventricular pleural or ventricular spinal or ventricular osseous shunts. Mention any two long-term complications. So there may be learning disabilities. We want to desist from using the term mental retardation. There may be epilepsy and there may be cerebral palsy. Station two, look at the image and answer. Part A, describe what you see. Part B, what is your diagnosis? Part C, what indicators confirm the diagnosis? Part D, what are the three phases of management? So I'll give you one second to think through this or you can pause the video if you so wish. So here comes the answers. This child has features of severe wasting. As you can see, there's loss of subcutaneous fat over the cheeks. There's also wrinkling of the face that we can see. And of course, poor hair distribution and discoloration of hair, if you can actually see. If you can't see, please increase the definition on your video so that you can see the images much more clearer. So what is your diagnosis? This child has severe acute malnutrition. If you haven't watched the video on Sam, then go to the playlist on pediatrics and watch the video. What indicator confirms the diagnosis? So you get a weight for height that is less than minus three standard deviation. You have a mid upper arm circumference that's less than 11.5 centimeters. You have presence of bilateral peating edema or features of severe wasting. You could have prominence of the ribs. You could have loss of the subcutaneous tissues in the cheeks as well as on the buttocks. So you get this baggy pants appearance. What are the three phases of management? You have stabilization phase, a transition phase, and a rehabilitation and follow-up phase. Station 3. Look at the image and answer the questions that follow. Name the equipment displayed. What is the indication for its use? Briefly describe how it works. Mention one contraindication for its use. List four side effects of this treatment. So as we can see on the right here, you have a baby and the machine is over there. So here comes the answer. Oh, sorry. Station three answer. So this child is under a phototherapy machine. And obviously this is done for children that mainly have unconjugated neonatal hyperbilirubinemia or unconjugated neonatal jaundice. Briefly describe how it works. So remember that this is going to be using blue light, which has a wavelength of 450 to 500, and 500 nanometers. Some books use a threshold of 420. So remember that this blue light is going to be causing photoisomerization, which is basically creating these water-soluble photoisomers of the unconjugated or indirect bilirubin through two main processes. Number one process is known as polar configurational isomers, which are the ZE enantiomers, the bilirubin, the enantiomers of bilirubin. Then you also have structural isomerization where you change bilirubin into other more water-soluble compounds such as lumirubin that can easily be excreted in the kidneys. 
The phototherapy machine can also perform photooxidation. Mention one contraindication for its use. It's contraindicated in conjugated hyperbilirubinemia because it may result in bronze baby syndrome. Then list four side effects of this treatment. So you could have photodermatitis, you could have temperature instabilities or hypothermia. You could have dehydration due to loss of the insensible losses of um, water. That could also lead to some electrolyte imbalances. You could have diarrhea. You could also have eye damage if the eyes aren't really covered adequately. So station four, look at the image below, name what you see, mention the three members in this group, what disease does it cause, mention one risk factor for this condition, mention any one drug for treating this condition. I'll give you one second to think through this. If you're enjoying the video, please subscribe, drop a comment below to show some support, drop some likes and share the video as well. So this is obviously just to sum a Mansonai uva. How do I know that this is Mansonai? Remember, Mansonai has a lateral spine. Hematobium, remember that the T in hematobium, T for terminal spine, so the terminal spine. So the spine will be at the terminal end of the uva. While this Mansonai has a lateral spine and Japonicum is round. So remember that schistosoma hematobium is responsible for causing urinary schistosomiasis or bilhazia. Schistosoma mansonii is responsible for causing intestinal schistosomiasis and so this is going to be intestinal schistosomiasis. Then mention one risk factor for the condition, contact with contaminated water. It could be ingestion of this water or even just swimming in water with this uh, parasite that's present inside. Then mention any one drug for treating this condition. You could use praziquantel. Station 5. Look at the image. Mention three important features you notice. What is the diagnosis? Mention one risk factor for the condition. Mention any three associated problems. So take your time to look at this picture and see what's wrong with the picture. So here comes the answer. So station 5. You have this child that's having these epicanthal folds to begin with. A flat nasal bridge up slanting palpebral fissures, low set ears, and of course a small mouth which we call microstomia and a much larger tongue which is known as macroglossia. So this child obviously has Down's syndrome or trisomy 21. One risk factor for this condition is advancing maternal age, especially parents or mothers that are beyond the age of 35. Then mention any three associated problems. They could have congenital heart disease. They could have hypothyroidism, hearing impairment, sometimes even visual impairment. They may have duodenal atresia, Hirschsprung's disease, and some learning disabilities. Station 5. Look at the procedure or equipment. Name the equipment. Mention any four drugs that can be used with this equipment. Mention any four conditions for which its use may be indicated. So on the right, you have that child there, and at the bottom, you have the same machine that this child is using. So here comes the answer. So this is obviously a nebulizer and a face mask, and the four drugs that can be used, salbutamol, which is an adrenergic agonist, short-acting. You could also use inhaled corticosteroids such as beclomethasone. You could use ipratropium bromide. You could use adrenaline. So mention any four conditions for which its use may be indicated in patients with asthma, acute asthmatic attack, in patients with acute bronchiolitis, croup, anaphylaxis, pneumonias, cystic fibrosis. You could use it also in bronchiectasis, atelectasis, and bronchospasms. Remember that in most of these conditions, the child is going to present to you with cyanosis, which may either be peripheral or central cyanosis. There may be a silent chest if it's severe cases where there's absolutely no air that's entering into the chest. There may be features of respiratory distress, things like use of accessory muscles, nasal flaring, intercostal recessions, and subcostal recessions. Station 5. Shown is the face and hands of a 5-year-old child. What do the images portray? What is the diagnosis? How does this disease come about? What complications or presentations is in the hand? So I'll give you some time to think through this. So here comes the answer. So this is obviously frontal bossing that you can see in this picture above. And in this picture below, you can see that the swelling of the digits of the fingers bilaterally, so that you refer to this as dactylitis. 
what is the diagnosis? This child most commonly has sickle cell disease. So remember that sickle cell disease is an inherited disorder and the inheritance pattern is going to be an autosomal recessive pattern. So what does this mean? It means that for a child to either have the sickle cell disease, their parents either have to be both sufferers of the disease, meaning that they both have to be sicklers, or both of them have to be carriers of the disease. What condition or presentation is shown in, uh, is in the hand? So this is acute dactylitis secondary to vaso-occlusive crisis. So station eight. This is a chest x-ray of a two-year-old child with cyanosis. Describe the salient features or feature. What is a probable diagnosis? List any four differential diagnoses for the cyanosis. Mention any two other signs the patient may present with. So I'll give you one second to think this through. Okay, so this is obviously a boot-shaped heart. As you can see, this is shaped like a boot. So you can, you can refer to it as a boot-shaped cardiac silhouette or boot-shaped heart. You also have oligemic lung fields, which are just simply, the lung fields are looking rather empty, like they do not have any vas a lot of vascular markings as they normally should. What is a probable diagnosis? This is obviously Tetralogy of Fallot. Remember, this is one of the many congenital cyanotic heart diseases, among others such as tricuspid atresia, transposition of the great vessels, trancosatriosis, total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. And remember that in Tetralogy of Fallot, it's made up of four components. So there's right ventricular outflow obstruction that is often due to pulmonic or subpulmonic obstruction. You also have right ventricular hypertrophy, which is going to be leading to this boot-shaped heart. You have overriding of the iota and of course an associated ventricular septal defect, thereby oxygenated blood mixes with deoxygenated blood. So mention any two other signs the patient may present with. So there may be a loud harsh ejection systolic murmur or there may be finger clubbing. Station nine, provided is a hemogram of a seven-year-old boy. Describe salient features you see. What additional investigations would you request? What is your impression? Mention any two possible causes of this picture. So here we have the WBC at 0 0.6, RBC at 1.88, hemoglobin at 6.8, hematocrit at 18.7, MCV at 99.4, MCH at 36.3, MCHC at 36.5, RDW at 17.5, and platelet count at 54. So here comes the answer. So obviously this is a low white blood cell count. The red blood cell count is also low. Hemoglobin is low. Hematocrit is low. The MCV is high. The MCHC is high. The MCHC and MCH are both high, the RDW is also high, and the platelet count is low. So this child has a pancytopenia. And then the additional investigations that I would want to do, I'll do a peripheral smear, I'll do a bone marrow aspirate or biopsy, as well as a reticulocyte count. What is my impression? This is obviously bone marrow failure, most commonly secondary to aplastic anemia. Mention any two possible causes of this blood picture. It could be myelofibrosis, Fanconi anemia, or viral infections. Station 10. Watch the video of a two-year-old neonate. Describe what you see. What is the diagnosis? Mention any four causes of what you see. If this is due to an infection or an infectious cause, mention any two long-term complications. So I'm going to play the video for you. So pay attention and watch through the video. Oh, before I show you the answers.
Okay, so that's the video. Let's go to the answers. So this is obvious. This chart is obviously showing some signs of automatism. There's some blinking, that repetitive blinking that's there, and there's lip smirking. So this chart is having a neonatal convulsion. Mention any four causes of what you are seeing. So it may be due to neonatal sepsis or meningitis, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, hypoglycemia, electrolyte imbalances, atrial venous malformations. So if this is due to an infectious cause, mention any two long-term complications. So it could complicate to hydrocephalus. It could complicate to cerebral palsy. It could also complicate to epilepsy. Station 11. This is a picture of an adolescent living with HIV. Picture 1. Write down your diagnosis and WHO stage. Part B. Picture 2. Write down your diagnosis and WHO staging. And then part C, what is the overall stage? So this is the image one, which doesn't appear so clear. And this is image two, which is rather more clear. So here comes the answer. So in part one, you obviously have Veruca plana. This looks like Veruca plana, though it's much not, it's not so clear. Remember that in the WHO staging, stage one, you either have the patient being asymptomatic or they're having unexplained uh, or rather... What do you call this? Pruritic, uh, generalized edema, rather. Then in stage two, that's where you have this oral and mucocutaneous manifestations, things like seborrheic dermatitis, things like verruca plana. So this is obviously falling under WHO stage two. Then finger clubbing is what is seen in picture two, which is seen in WHO stage three. So the overall stage for this is three. We usually go with the highest stage or the feature that's from a higher stage. Station 12, a five-year-old boy presents with easy fatigability and poor growth since birth. What signs do you see? What is the most likely cause of these signs? What investigations would you do? So obviously this child has finger clubbing and we can see that there is also peripheral cyanosis here. So this child obviously has a congenital cyanotic heart disease. So we want to order a chest x-ray, you want to do an ECG, you want to do an echo as well as a full blood count with a differential count. Station 13. This is a picture of a nine-year-old child recently diagnosed with HIV. On examination, her right lower limb is edematous but non-pitting. What is your diagnosis? Assign a WHO stage to this condition. How would you confirm the diagnosis? So you can pause the video right now. And here comes the answer. So obviously this child has acute lymphadenopathic carposis sarcoma. So this is one of the presentations that's very common in children. And KS, or Kaposi sarcoma, is a tumor. So that's obviously falling under WHO stage 4. And to confirm this diagnosis, you would take a skin biopsy. And what would you see this under the microscope of the skin biopsy? You may see spindle-like shaped cells. You may see extravasated red blood cells, as well as prominent slit-like vascular spaces. Station 14. Study the graph. Identify the investigation shown on the right. What is the diagnosis? Give four clinical features of this condition. What is the inheritance pattern of this condition? So here is the graph. Have a look at it. Pause the video if you may. But here comes the answer. So this is a graph showing you fetal hemoglobin here at 7%. Adult hemoglobin, it's almost a 0%. HBS hemoglobin, which is at 93%. So obviously this is an hemoglobin electrophoresis. It gives you a result like this in percentages. This child obviously has sickle cell disease. So four clinical features, they may have frontal bossing, painful symmetrical swelling of the digits and the toes. They may be recurrent abdominal as well as back pains, and they may have jaundice. So what is the inheritance pattern of this condition? Autosoma recessive, like we talked about in the previous question. Station 15. Describe what you see in the picture. Give two risk factors for this condition. Name four short-term complications related to this condition. Write down two long-term complications due to this condition. You can pause the video right now. And if you're enjoying the videos, why aren't you subscribed? Because 25% of the individuals that are actually watching these videos are not yet subscribed. So what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification button too so that you can be receiving notifications every time I post such videos so that you do not miss out anything on the channel. So here comes the answer. So this is obviously a child that's very small sized neonate. As you can see here, they, they're almost fitting in the palm of this person's hand and their skin 
appears to be very thin, so they usually have this fragile skin. And so this is obviously prematurity. Then give two risk factors for this condition. So maternal gestational diabetes, you could have preeclampsia, you could have placenta previa, premature rupture of membranes, polyhydramnios, or multiple gestations. Name four short-term complications related to this condition. Hypoglycemia, because the liver and the pancreas are not yet well developed to control the blood glucose. You could have respiratory distress syndrome because there's not enough surfactant in the lungs. You could have necrotizing enterocolitis if you feed the children too early. You could have hypothermia because the regulatory centers and even the skin is not so developed. The same reason why you could also have fluid and electrolyte imbalances and you could also have intraventricular hemorrhage. Write down two long-term complications due to these conditions. You could have rickets of prematurity, blindness, learning disabilities, cerebral palsy, retinopathy of prematurity, and hearing impairment. Question 16. Name the item shown on the right. What is it used for? State the range on it to determine the worst degree of your answer to QB or question B. Write down two ways of assessing, two other ways of assessing the condition in question 2B or question B rather. So take your time. I know you've seen this on the word. Just relax, calm down. When you're in the exam, take a deep breath if you've forgotten what it is and remember this video. So here comes the answer. So this is obviously a Shakir tape, a mid upper arm circumference tape, but refer to it as a Shakir tape. So it's used in measuring the MUAC, of, of course, to make a diagnosis of severe acute malnutrition. And the worst or the benchmark is at less than 11.5 centimeters. I think there is a correction in my video where I gave you a, a reading of 12.5 centimeters. It was actually supposed to be 11.5 centimeters. Then write down to other ways of assessing the condition. So anthropometrics, you could use a weight for height score, uh, Z scores that are less than minus three SD. You could take the triceps uh, skin fold thickness, or you could have some clinical features such as wasting and bilateral pitting edema. Station 17, this is an under five card. Beside growth monitoring, name three activities that are usually carried out in the uh, relevant clinic. Give three live attenuated vaccines that are given in this clinic. Outline the schedule of visits to the clinic under the Zambian EPI, that's Extended Program uh, Immunization Program, and which one is absolutely contraindicated in symptomatic HIV. So take, some, take your time, think through this question, pause the video if you may, but here comes the answer. So we give, immun we give vaccines, so we immunize the children in under five, we can also give vitamin A supplementation. We may test this child for HIV. We can deworm this child as well as providing nutritional health education to the mother. Give three live attenuated vaccines that are given in this clinic. So you give BCG, which is bacilli, carmetel, guarin, then measles and rubella. So outline the schedule. So the schedule is as follows. So you give vaccines at intervals. Usually the intervals are four weeks apart. So the first vaccines that you're going to be giving at birth. So you can give it at birth or within the first 13 days. So the two vaccines that you can give, BCG is mandatory that you give it and you only give it once. OPV is also give OPV zero, which is oral polio vac vaccine. Zero is can be given, but if you don't give it, then you have to give OPV four. But then if you have given OPV zero, then you do not have to give OPV four. Then the next set of vaccines are given at six weeks. So you give your OPV1, you give your diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, hepatitis B, and haemophilus influenza B1. You give your pneumococcal vaccine 1 and your rotor vaccine 1 at six weeks. Then four weeks after that, which means it will be at 10 weeks, you give your OPVs, OPV2, you give your diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, uh, hepatitis B, and haemophilus influenza B. Two, you give your, pneumo your second pneumococcal vaccine, you give your second rotav rotavirus vaccine. That's at 14 weeks, or 10 weeks rather. Then four weeks later, that's at 14 weeks, you give your OPV3. You also give IPV, which is in, uh, the inactivated polio vaccine. You give your DPT, hip, heb, third dose. You give your PCV3. And then at nine, nine months, then you may give your OPV4 uh, if you haven't given your OPV0. You give your measles and rubella, and then also at 18 months, you give your measles and rubella. So remember that 
these timings, you should master them and you should know which vaccines are given at which stage. If you don't know this yet, so refer to the, my video on immunization and vaccination schedule. I've talked about all this in the video in much more detail. Which one is an absolutely contraindicated in symptomatic HIV? BCG, measles, and rubella. For obvious reasons, because these are live attenuated vaccines, they have the propensity of causing vaccine-associated disease. Station 18. 11-month-old girl presents with severe malnutrition. What is the diagnosis? What important disease would you ask about in the history? What micronutrient is lacking in this condition? How would you manage this condition? What is the possible complication? Take your time, pause your video. You may even zoom the image if you do not see it very adequately, but I think it should be clear enough. So here comes the answer. So obviously this is a corneal opacity that's there. This looks like a, a bite or spot. And obviously the disease that you'd look for is measles and they've already given you malnutrition so you do not have to repeat this. So just state measles and then what micronutrient is lacking so that's vitamin a and how would you manage this condition so you give vitamin a supplementation if it's an infant between zero to five months you give fifty thousand international units if they're between six months to twelve months you give a hundred thousand international units if they are greater than one year you give two hundred thousand international units you give the same dose at day zero when they present day two and day 14 and then of course if this child is older than a year but they're weighing less than 8 kg they should receive half the dose that's a thousand one hundred thousand international units the complication that could arise from this is corneal perforation and blindness station 19 a three-year-old girl presents with history of diarrhea and vomiting she is lethargic what is the sign what other signs would you look for what is the level of dehydration how would you treat the dehydration you can pause the video at this moment and here's the picture and here's the sign that is shown. So the sign is that there is a poor skin targa. So what other signs would you look for? There would be a depressed uh, anterior fontanelle, but rather in this case, this child is a three year old. So I just realized that this answer here is rather not really thought through as much. So just cancel the uh, depressed anterior fontanelle. I think let's cancel that so that we do not mislead the masses because I don't want you to be quoting that this child has a depressed anterior fontanelle when they are three years old. So this child has a sunken eyes, dry mucous membranes, and delayed capillary refill time. What is the level of dehydration? So this child has severe dehydration. Remember that this child is lethargic and they have poor skin tagger. So those are two signs and two signs are enough to classify them as severe dehydration. If they were Having no dehydration, they will be alert. If they're having some dehydration, they will be a bit drowsy. But here they're very lethargic. So how would you treat the dehydration? So you'd use your WHO plan C. So that's 100 um, mils, not milligrams, 100 mils per kg of Ringer's lactate or half-strength Dyrus solution. And you're going to run it as follows. So you're going to be given it in an overall of three hours because this child is above one year. So you're going to be giving 30 mils per kg or 30% in 30 minutes, 70 mils per kg or 70% in two and a half hours. The station 20 and indeed the last one, an eight year old boy presents to the hospital like this. What is the sign? What is your diagnosis? What other signs would you look for in this child? What investigation would you do to confirm your diagnosis? What are some of the complications? So it looks like as if this child is demon possessed, but of course we do not believe in demons in science. So take your time and pause the video. So here comes the answer. So this is opistotinus and this is seen in generalized tetanus. So what other signs would you look for? You would see rhesus sedonicus. You would also do a spatula test, which may be positive. So how do you do a spatula test? You just simply touch, you take a spatula and you touch the posterior pharyngeal wall. Um, and what you observe what's going to happen. If there is a contraction, involuntary contraction of the jaw and it clamps down in your spatula, then that's a positive spatula test. If there's a negative spatula test, then you'll get a, a gag reflex. Then what investigation would you do to confirm your diagnosis? So usually, it's, um, tetanus is usually diagnosed clinically, but you may do a lumbar puncture, which may show an increase in opening pressure, especially during the spasms. You may check for the levels of the serum muscle enzymes, such as creat creatine kinase, even aldolase that may be elevated. 
you may also check the levels of serum antitoxin, um, antitoxin levels. And if they are very high, it means that this child most likely may not have tetanus or tetanus. What are some of the complications? So you could have aspiration pneumonia, long bone fractures, pulmonary embolism, malnutrition, urinary retention, shoulder, as well as temporal mandibular dislocations. That is indeed the last and final season finale of season one, pediatrics. I hope you enjoyed over the course of the bazooka as we're discussing pediatrics. I know that your exam is very soon. Please do well at your exam and I hope these videos go a long way and they help you in transforming you to become the best medical practitioner that you may be. Subscribe if you haven't. Share the video to someone who's writing an exam very soon. Comment.